I don't normally speak on a theme that is so intertwined with psychological theory. I'm much more a philosopher, rather delve into the ideas on the history of thought or do social analysis. But after having been on the radio for a few times in a give and take uh, Q&A times across the air, this issue surfaced repeatedly. And so I have very plainly entitled this message, Why Don't I Feel My Faith? Or what if I can't feel my faith? When every commitment intellectually has been made, you expect that somehow there will be an engendering of the emotion that will conform to what it is you claim to believe in the mind or in the intellect. But many, many times if we are brutally honest with ourselves, that feeling has either lapsed momentarily or somehow is not there with the same sturdiness that you would like to enjoy. And so that is the message that I want to bring to you. First, let me introduce it for you. And after introducing it, turn to two or three glimpses that we will need to take, bridging towards the end on the look that will provide for us the only legitimate answer and tie it together at the end with a conclusion. How then do I apply all of this thought, particularly at a time where psychologists are delving deeper and deeper into this? Two years ago, a prominent scholar, David Goldman, who has taught at Harvard and was formerly the senior editor of Psychology Today, he wrote a fascinating book called Emotional Intelligence. I haven't completely read it, but I have looked at it in a cursory glance and read one or two chapters that I think convey to us the heart of his thinking. He begins that book with a very powerful illustration as he talks about a couple by the name of Gary and Mary Jean Chauncey in 1993, comfortably and quietly traveling along in that Amtrak train that was then going to come upon the bridge that had been damaged, having been hit some time before, and all of a sudden that bridge caved in, and this train went plummeting into the waters that were going to gobble up many into an early grave. And this couple, Gary and Mary Jean Chauncey, were struggling to keep themselves above water. But their biggest challenge on hand was what to do with their 11-year-old, Audrey, who had cerebral palsy and was wheelchair-bound. And mother and dad worked furiously, only uh, with desperate attempts to try and get her through either a window or a door into the hands of rescuers. And gloriously, they succeeded. And Audrey was rescued by the hands of those who were in the waters, but she lost her mom and dad in the process in their last effort to give her the gift of life. And David Goldman, as he introduces that, in a staggering footnote to that episode, tries to explain how do you interpret this capacity within the human mind, not intellect. He is very definite about that. He's talking about the mind. And he says, of course, we need to understand what Darwin's theory has done for us here. The protection of the progeny at the hands of the stronger so that they will guard their own offspring. Why he had to go to a mindless atheistic evolutionary theory in order to explain such a heroic act, of course, I don't know other than that it betrays some philosophical prejudices. But even he is not satisfied with that because the mind transcends that kind of situation. And he says the only word to describe it is the word love. What is this simple epithet? that comes into our lives so many times, either as a longing and as a need, or as receptors in an experience. And here mother and dad, dying themselves, giving their little 11-year-old girl that gift of love and that gift of life. Isn't it fascinating how in these moments we reach for some moral point of reference to explain what it is we have just witnessed? I wonder what Professor Goldman would have said if he'd been with us a few weeks ago 
when two or three of my colleagues and I were in a taxi in a city that I shall leave unnamed and a country also unnamed. But there was a thronging mass around us. I don't think it would be exaggerative to say if you had just stood out of that taxi, you could have probably seen thousands of people milling around, elbowing their way into every space available as they were crossing the street or trying to get in to the railway station to get their train for work. And all of a sudden we heard this pounding on the window. And we were about to lower the window and he stopped us. But here was a beggar woman clutching a little baby in her arms uh, and the baby also with the uh, hand reached out and almost a planted expression of misery as it were on the child's face and the woman and the child reaching out asking for some money. We were about to do something when he shooed her away and then told us don't give it to such people these children are rented out here by people by parents who have them and then they are trained by these beggars to have this begging expression and they make an awful lot of money exploiting tourists and people some of them indeed are pretty well to do now we sense the surge of emotion on the one hand looking at this pitiful sight two outstretched hands and feeling sorry for the woman who had to make a living that way and all of a sudden the emotion surged in a different direction when we found out that she may not have been a victim herself as much as she could have been a victimizer what I'm trying to point out to you very simply is this within the framework of human emotions there are two inescapable components if you want to interpret them correctly one is the component of morality you cannot just describe heroism by some Darwinistic naturalistic explanation the mind cannot stop there it reaches to something more laudable something higher but there is a second component and that is the component of information so that as legitimate as our emotions were swirling with pity for what we thought was mother and child all of a sudden the emotions were equally intense but the information had now challenged that emotion in a different direction Do you follow what I'm saying our feelings are real we cannot escape them but equally important is to take those feelings and put them within a moral and an informational framework and this desire comes very very early in life I believe I'm in the process of reading one of the most fascinating books I have ever read it is very simply called father and son written by one of the great literary scholars Edmund Goss it was sent to me by the preacher who is at the Duke Street Baptist Church in London one time the pastor was held by F.B. Meyer and this particular friend of mine who's pastoring there now sent me this book after we teamed up together in the Orient and he said Ravi you're gonna have to read this just listening to your arguments as an apologist this book will move you the whole story is about young Edmund Goss who basically grew up this young genius and was ultimately going to reject the faith of his father and his mother to which he gave many rationalistic reasons but listen to how he describes emotionally his response when he was only seven and saw the death of his mother it's a fascinating way to describe it by a genius now and for the first time in my life I no longer saw my mother's mild eyes smile on me with the earliest sunshine twice a day after breakfast and before I went to rest I was brought to her bedside but we were never again alone other people sometimes strange people were there we had no cozy talk often she was too weak to do more than pat my hand her loud and almost constant cough terrified and harassed me I felt as I stood awkwardly and shyly by her high bed that I had shrunken into a very small and insignificant figure that she was now floating out of my reach that all things but I knew not what nor how were coming to an end she herself was not herself her head that used to be held so erect now rolled or sank upon the pillow the sparkle was all extinguished from those dear eyes I could not understand it I meditated long long upon it all in my infantile darkness in the garret or in the little slip of a cold room where my bed was now placed and a great blind 
anger against I know not what awakened in my soul. Imagine a young seven-year-old boy who sees his mother slipping away is able to with such a cryptic statement express what he felt at that young age, a kind of a blind anger, but an anger that he did not know against what was now awakened within his soul. And so, my dear friend, when we look at this arena of emotions with which we all live, we find that it comes early in life, looking for a moral framework. Why would a seven-year-old boy be angry? Why wouldn't he just somehow find out that this is what life was all about? It was a given, especially as he was to surrender to the naturalistic theories later on in life. But that emotion of anger rose up. The emotion of love is describing the instance of a couple sparing the life of their child. And then we see the emotion of pathos suddenly turned to consternation, just sitting in a car trying to explain what was happening around us. And the fascinating thing, ladies and gentlemen, is that more and more modern humanity is trying to understand why we feel the way we do. Is this just glandular? Is this just conditioning? And there's a kind of a dark side, light side, noble side to it. I don't watch too much television, and I've heard that the commercials are the best part of it. But I do remember during one sporting game seeing a commercial with one of the beer companies. I don't know if you've seen that. It's this fellow who has uh, been counseled earlier on or advised by his buddies to give up his local beer in order for some foreign brew. And he's sitting in the office of this counselor now who's trying to uh, rescue him from this choice he had made earlier on. It's all supposed to be funny. Have you seen that? And this young fellow is sitting there in the couch and this comedian is playing the role of the Freudian psychoanalyst and he says to him, tell me what happened. And he said, well, well, they, you know, they told me that uh, I was uh, going to find a better beer when I would uh, just go for this import brand. And he says, and how did you feel about it? He says, well, you know, I, I, I really felt very betrayed. I felt really betrayed. And he goes on to talk about the better taste that he wished he had in the local beer and wish he could make the change. And he was ready to make the change now. And how do you feel about it? The whole idea is focus on the feeling. They know how to make a jest at it. But now because of the incursion of computers, it is no longer how do you feel about it in a joke. Now they're trying to wonder what is the difference between a computer, a thinking machine, and a human being. And they are not able to arrive at an answer without using the word feeling. Feeling is now no more humorous it is bringing with it a whole context of soul and other concepts. Look at the Time Magazine article recently, written by Professor Dale Gelertner, Professor of Computer Science at Yale. Listen to the fascinating exposition he gives of how Deep Blue, the computer that was going to be matched up against Garry Kasparov, when he wrote it, the match hadn't taken place. As we all know, Kasparov was beaten. But listen to what he says. The idea that deep blue has a mind is absurd. How can an object that wants nothing, fears nothing, enjoys nothing, needs nothing, and cares about nothing have a mind? It can win at chess, but not because it wants to. It isn't happy when it wins or sad when it loses. What are Deep Blue's apre match plans if it beats Kasparov? Is it hoping to take Deep Pink out for a night out on the town? <laughs> It doesn't care about chess or anything else. It plays the game for the same reason a calculator adds or a toaster toasts. Because it is a machine designed for that purpose. No matter what feats they perform, inside there will always be a big zero. No computer can achieve artificial thought without achieving artificial emotion too. And then he goes on to say this, listen please, in the long run, I doubt if there is any kind of human behaviors computers can't fake, any kind of performance they can't put on. It is conceivable that one day computers will be better than humans in nearly everything. I can imagine that a person might someday have a computer as a best friend. 
But that will be sad, like having a dog for a best friend, but even sadder. But the gap between the human and the surrogate is permanent and will never be closed. Machines will continue to make life easier, healthier, richer, and more puzzling. And human beings will continue to care ultimately about the things they always have about one another and many of them about God. This dimension of the soul, this dimension of feeling. And yet, my dear friend, isn't it sad how often we seek answers on this very subject that I've raised for you right now. Why don't I feel God if I know him? I'm in church. I'm a committed Christian. I do all of these things. But sometimes God seems so distant and far. There is no felt presence of the infinite being himself. I recall on one radio program, which is what prompted my mind to deal with this subject, Somebody driving in a car had phoned in and asked me about this question. Why she didn't feel the presence of God in her life. And of course you've got two minutes soundbite answers to give. And in fact the program was coming to an end and I had to sign off. A few days later another young woman miles away from here wrote to me. It was a sad letter. I looked at it again and again and did not know how to satisfactorily respond to her. She said, Mr. Zacharias, I listen to these radio programs regularly. She talked about our radio program and so on. She said, but I want to say something to you. As soon as I heard that question raised on the air, I was in my car too. I swerved over to the side of the road. I wanted an answer to that question because I struggle with it too. I was so disappointed. There was no answer so forthcoming and the tragedy I sensed with her was twofold first she desperately wanted an answer for it and secondly somewhere in her innocence or her naivete she actually thought that something as profound as this could be satisfactorily answered in a two-minute response on a radio program let me do my best to unfold an answer as plainly as I can and if you can only wait till the last few moments to anchor it because I think that's where the Bible wants us to get off on a subject so real as this. So let me take three looks to find an answer. Why don't I feel my faith? With all that I think I know about God, why don't I feel him any closer than I do? I think the first thing to do is to take an outward look. To take a look at humanity as we encounter one another. What it is that we learn from each other. And we find out very quickly how important feelings are and that we all have them. At my table is a good friend, Nick Charles, who is a sports broadcaster with CNN. And we were talking just now about the sudden tragic situation of Konstantinov who played hockey for the Red Wings. And uh, having uh, won the Stanley Cup, they were in a celebratory mood. And all of a sudden, within a matter of hours, they were involved in that terrible car accident. And he's lying in a hospital now, unconscious. That jubilation, that joy that must have spread to a lot of people, especially his family, when he said this was the pinnacle moment of his hockey career, suddenly, now possibly cut short or certainly daunted or threatened in some way. The reality of feelings, the surging of emotions, but more to the point, we, when we look around us and take this outward look, we get puzzled when we do not see emotional responses the way we think we ought to see them. When I was speaking in Hong Kong uh, last year, a man in the audience stood up. It was a question and answer time. He was a Nietzschean. He was an atheist, a kind of a nihilist, believed in the philosophy of despair and was trying to defend Nietzschean philosophy. It is very difficult to do and he proved it, was, it could not be done. I waved him over to the front afterwards. I said, I'd like to talk to you one-on-one. Uh, -on -one. Because Nietzsche, of course, that uh, very, very prolific atheistic writer, however well-intentioned he may have been. So I said to him, if you really believe what you have just said to me in public, that morality was a figment of our imagination, that morality had no real point of reference, I said, do you really believe that? He said, I do. I said, let me ask you a question. If I were to take a newly born baby, a fresh glimpse of life there, 
take that little child with all of its exuberance and so on and brought that baby onto this platform and I took an axe or a sword and just chopped the head of that baby off. How would you feel? Would you think I have done something wrong? You'd be shocked at what he said to me. And a whole group of people standing around me. He said, well, let me put it this way. I will not like what you did, but I cannot say you would have done anything wrong. I said, you know, there are three aspects of evil. There's the fact of evil. There is the face of evil. And there's the feeling of evil. The fact there's an objective moral law we all somehow subscribe to. There's a face where we look to responsibility when there's a violation of it. And there's a feeling that a response we have. I said even you with your nihilistic philosophy tried to do away with the fact. You've tried to do away with the face. But you could not do away with the feeling. You said I will not like it. Why not? I don't know if you ever got a glimpse of the trial going on of Timothy McVeigh. I was sitting next to a psychiatrist in California about two weekends ago, and he made an interesting comment to me. This man is in the latter years of his practice, ready to retire. And I mentioned to him how I was sitting at the Atlanta airport, ready to fly out to a city. And here we were in that crowded setting and watching the news on television. And the testimony was being given about the incident that McVeigh was involved in. And one of the factors that was mentioned was the man prosecuting him raised the question of one of the witnesses. Did you ever talk about the fact that innocent people could be killed, children could be killed, all kinds of innocent bystanders could be destroyed by a bomb so powerful. And the witness said, yes, sir, we did. But when we talked about it, his answer was, ah, they are, have guilt by association. They are involved with this evil regime. And they may not be involved directly, but by associating with this kind of a government, they are evil themselves. All of these children, all of these so-called innocent people. It was fascinating to look around the people sitting and standing, watching that screen. Every one of them at the same time just shook their heads in disbelief. What were they all responding to? How is it possible to make such a feelingless comment about the death and the blowing up of innocent children? So when we look outward, we sense it. Psychiatrists deal with post-traumatic stress disorders. And this psychiatrist was telling me in California, he said, I said, what is the most important thing you've learned in the last few years? He said, can I tell you something, Ravi? He said, in the law, and this man is, was not a professing believer in Christ. He was there for an evangelistic outreach. He said, in the last eight years, all of my patients have been men. And the only thing I've been dealing with is how men for years have been taught to suppress their feelings and not be honest about their emotions. And some of the trauma they run into in their own lives because of this suppression, he said, I could write volumes on it. Just yesterday, I was reading the People magazine issue of this young 18-year-old girl by the name of Melissa Drexler in Aberdeen, New Jersey, who is at her prom enjoying this evening, excuses herself from her boyfriend, goes into the restroom, and basically delivers her six-pound, six-ounce baby. Except she takes that very baby, puts it into the garbage bag, puts it into the waste bin there, and walks out after tidying herself as if absolutely nothing had happened, and goes over to the disc jockey and asks him to play one of her favorite tunes. Till literally the trail of blood is followed by somebody and looked into the restroom, and this baby is found. People who were there at her arraignment said the most stunning thing was when she was confronted with it, completely expressionless on her face. Completely expressionless. It was as though it was a foreign object she'd swallowed that she had now spit out and that was all there was to it. So you see the McVeigh sitting placidly. You see a young 18 year old girl like this and People magazine basically is now not even able to ask the question they used to. Now they're saying how have they gone so very, very wrong? When you look around, you find out emotions 
especially the legitimacy of emotions, is expected by us. You don't expect a totally callous individual. And I think God has planted that into us. He's given us many a clue. You even take the physiological makeup of the human body. What happens if you were to suffer a severe wound on that arm? Several things will happen. Immediately you will notice a swelling develop, a redness develop. Why is that? Because all of a sudden a dilatation has taken place in the capillaries. The blood is just surging in there to expand the blood vessels with an increased porosity so that the plasma can exude through those pores and the white blood cells or the phagocytes as they call them, literally meaning the devouring cells, can go through those pores, destroy the debris, destroy the bacteria, and the increased supply of oxygen with the blood can bring healing. But there's a sensitivity to that spot blunted by God, basically to indicate to you and me, protect it. Protect it. You keep doing damage to that and you will wound it in an even greater way. What then happens when emotions have lost their sensitivity? Look around and observe. I think God reminds us in his book how important the emotions are. And some of his greatest servants remind us that they are indicators of a spiritual reality. Listen to the words of David in Psalm 42. As the deer pants for the streams of water, so my soul pants for you, O God. My soul thirsts for God, for the living God. When can I go and meet with God? My tears have been my food day and night, while men say to me all day long, where is your God? God. These things I remember as I pour out my soul. How I used to go with the multitude, leading the procession to the house of God, with shouts of joy and thanksgiving among the festive throng. Why are you downcast, O my soul? Why so disturbed within me? Put your hope in God, for I will yet praise him. My soul is downcast within me, therefore I will remember you from the land of Jordan. Deep calls to deep, which means just keep surging on and on. By day the Lord directs his love, his, at night his song is with me. I say to God, my rock, why have you forgotten me? Why must I go about mourning oppressed by the enemy? My bones suffer mortal agony as my foes taunt me, saying to me all day long, where is your God? The Bible tells us emotions are real and some of his choicest servants experienced it and when you look around, you see it is a legitimate cry. So we take an outward look and we see the legitimacy of emotions. Now we take an inward look and we now have to find out our distinctiveness. Why is it that we react individually the way you do? You look at someone else and say, he or she didn't react the same way. Why did I get so angry so easily? Why do I get so upset so easily? I remember my mother saying to me once when I was starting to get into philosophy and apologetics and all of that, my mother was a teacher, but she was a very simple woman. And one day she said to me, I don't know why you ask such questions. I don't even know why you think such things, she said. These things have never crossed my mind. We're different. We're different. I could hear some thought or read some line in a book and I'd pace the floor for about 15 minutes saying, how does one wrestle with this? How does one deal with this? Let me ask you a few questions, for example, because we know how important it is to understand ourselves. Question number one, what experiences or struggle did you bring into your relationship with God? Was there a childhood, was there an upbringing that struggled with some ideas? Let me assure you, at time it'll surface, at time it'll come. We are indebted to psychological theory for understanding this. Even though I have entered my fifth decade of life, probably at this stage more than any other, sad experiences or humiliating experiences with somebody who you loved dearly, have become suddenly louder within my emotional being. I could have been 12 or 13 and something could have been said to me that suddenly comes back in your mind and you swallow hard and say, did he really mean that when he said it? Did he really think I'd come to nothing? An Olympic athlete whom I shall leave unnamed came to visit me here in Atlantis a couple of years ago. I won't name him 
but I'll try my best and to guard his identity, even though if he were here, he would share it with you. He sat across the table at a hotel where we were having lunch, this muscle-bound individual. He was going to win a medal, he was sure. He said, from the time I was 12, I was determined I was going to make the Olympics one day. He said, I never ran up one step at a time from the time I was 12. I climbed two or three. I was always in a conditioning mode. He said, then I watched the event I wanted to do. And as I got into my teens, I bought myself a video camera and I filmed the world champion in that event. And then I had somebody film me. We were just a few seconds apart. And I went up into my room and cut it into individual slides along the whole event and wanted to see where I was losing those seconds to him. How could I make up? Was it at the 50 meter mark? Was it at the 60 meter mark? I was going to meet this man and beat him. And I worked away slide by slide by slide till I was ready for the championship. And the Olympic Games were upon us and the world was watching and I was tipped to win the Olympic gold medal then. But even as I was standing right at the top about for the gun to sound, he said, Ravi, you'd never, never believe and nobody will understand this. As I was literally seconds away waiting from the gunshot, ready to take off for this moment for which I'd lived for for so long, a thought flashed into my mind. I wonder if my father is watching. And he said, because it was my dad who looked at me in my early teens and said I was a good for nothing and nothing was ever going to come out of my life. He said, here I was ready for the greatest moment where something was going to come of my life. And what do you think comes into my mind? Is this going to be nothing too? I wonder if my dad's watching. You bring that into an experience. I know whereof I speak. And you have to ask yourself the question when the feelings seem distant, is that part of the struggle? Have you read the biography of William Cooper, the great poet and songwriter who worked with John Newton in Olney in England? We visited John Newton's church and seen the words of his great hymn, Amazing Grace, and many of William Cooper's hymns etched on glass there too. Cooper was the music director for John Newton. And the reason William Cooper went to work with John Newton is because Cooper was a very morbid personality, constantly given to depression. He is the one who wrote, God moves in a mysterious way, his wonders to perform. He plants his footsteps in the sea and rides upon the storm. His purposes will ripen fast, unfolding every hour. The bud may have a bitter taste, but sweet will be the flower. Blind unbelief is sure to err and scan his works in vain. God is his own interpreter and he will make it plain. William Cooper is also the one who wrote, There is a fountain filled with blood drawn from Emmanuel's veins, and sinners plunge beneath the flood, lose all their guilty stains. The dying thief rejoiced to see that fountain in his day, and so may I, though vile as he, wash all my sins away. But it is the same William Cooper towards the end of his life who wrote, Where is the joy that once I knew when first I saw the Lord? Where is the soul's refreshing view of Jesus and his word? What peaceful hours I once enjoyed, how sweet their memory still, but they have left an aching void this world can never fill. He brought that personality through his life through pendular swings. There's a second question. What in disciplines did we bring into our Christian experience? What in disciplines? May I say that here the answers begin to unfold. Having taught at a graduate level for some years and working closely in the academic world for many years now and having observed my own life, I have noticed that those who are separating in lines of accomplishment are often not those in capability but those in discipline. Those who have known to apply themselves, buy up the time, redeem the time, take up the hours, and make them to be constructive. At Stanford University, 30-some years ago, a test was done with four-year-olds. They were all given a marshmallow in their hands, and they were told that in a few minutes the teacher would come back, and those who had not eaten that marshmallow and waited would get a second one. But those who had eaten it, would not get another one. And they had a camera in there and filmed these four-year-olds. Some young fellows hitting their forehead, you know, just <laughs> clenching their teeth and gritting and looking away, pushing it. I think I would have been one of those at that time. Put it in the pocket. Don't even look at it or you're going to consume it. And there were some just, you know, this is the rule. I want to. I'm going to wait. 
Thirty years later, they have studied the same group of people. There is an incredible line of difference between those who gobbled it up and those who waited. Those who were willing to live with delayed gratification across the years from their adolescence all the way up to now, even to the point of a remarkable difference in their SAT scores. Enormous difference. And the Stanford psychologist said, you watch the child who is not able to resist early and you better train that child soon or this boy or girl will go through all of life whatever they see, they want, and they're going to get it. Forget the cost. What disciplines did we bring in? Thirdly and importantly, what wrong idea of God did we bring into this relationship? I look at Peter the Apostle. When Jesus talked about the cross, Peter said, you're not heading that way, Lord. That is not going to be your destiny. And I remind you that so many of us have this idea of God that there is going to be nothing beyond the joy, nothing beyond the delight as soon as we make that commitment. This is a very critical, tragic error that we make. A friend of mine had shown me the words of the contemporary singing group U2, and basically one of the songs says, I still haven't found what I'm looking for. He describes all the experiences he's had, including talking about Christ as a kind of a been there, done that kind of thing, but still haven't found what I'm looking for. So when you look outward, you see the legitimacy of emotions. When you look inwards, you may see some misbegotten emotions that are distinctively yours. Where then lies the answer? It starts in what is called the upward look. And before I go that, let me give this to you as a bridge illustration because I think the answers will put this together for us. In October of 1994, a little after 1 a.m. in the morning, our telephone rang. And I have the permission of the people for whom this happened to share this with you. In fact, I just wrote it out so they could look at it and approve it for me sharing it with you. It was my wife's sister. In fact, her son is here at our table tonight, and they would be here too, except they are celebrating their anniversary a few miles away from here, visiting us from Longview, Texas. At about 1.15 in the morning, I'd picked up the phone and she said, Ravi, and as soon as she said that, I sensed something was wrong. She said, we've got a real problem and I don't know what's happened to Gordon. Gordon's her husband, who's a flight instructor at Laterno University in Longview, Texas. She said, he took off several hours ago and for 10 hours there has been no contact with him. He was training two young students in mountain flying in Colorado. And he said all of the places that he had had in his flight plan have not heard from him. Ten hours have gone by, not hearing from that small plane. We know something is wrong, but we don't know what it is. She just cried. She said something serious has happened to Gordon. Three hours went by, the phone again still hadn't heard. I think it was about 16 or 17 hours after the incident had taken place, she heard. And what had happened was that Gordon with these two boys, one of them was flying that, somehow they got into a blind canyon. And Gordon was trying to turn it around now to get it out of the blind canyon. They were pulled by a downward draft and came crashing into that canyon there. That plane just splintered and broke and all of these so terribly, terribly broken. Gordon had broken his legs in two or three places. He'd broken both his feet. He'd broken both his hands. His forehead had been smashed within a fourteenth of an inch from the brain. And there he was going in and out of consciousness while the rescue team had found him. It was fascinating to talk to Gordon after he'd been rescued and find out what was going on in those 15 hours that he was alone and the three of them couldn't communicate with each other. One of them with his leg just about bent over the back of his shoulder. And he said to me something very interesting. All along, Barbara was struggling with no information and her emotions sensing the worst. On the other end of it, Gordon, not able to feel because of the broken body, but one desperate longing in his heart. I wish somebody could get to Barbara, tell her that I love her and that I'll be all right. In that little scenario, as heartbreaking as it was for them, and over all these years, his body has only been 
put back together in some way. It's a miracle that the three men lived. But in that simple scenario, I think of the words of Will Durant, nothing educates us like a shock. May I remind you what went on here? To one, the surge of emotion without information. To another, all the information needed but the incapacity to feel. Something was broken. And what was needed in that moment was someone who could take what he knew and put it into her mind so that she knew he would be all right. And someone who could take that body and put it back together so he could feel again with reality and legitimacy. That's what the upward look is going to do for us. Because as I think of it, pause with me for a moment. Of all the descriptions of God that could have been given right from the beginning. It doesn't say in the beginning was love even though it would have been true. It doesn't even say in the beginning was grace even though that would be true. It says in the beginning was the word. The word. A concept. Language. Knowledge. Wisdom. Rationality. We talk about taking somebody at his or her word. Here the word and the being are identical when the word became flesh and dwelt among us. Let us look now to the concept of language as we take that upward look. The first concept is this, that God has spoken to us to remind us that feelings are a vital part of our being, but always to condition them and bring to them information. Listen to how the Apostle Peter puts it in 2 Peter 1. We did not follow cleverly invented stories when we told you about the power and the coming of our Lord Jesus Christ, but we were eyewitnesses of his majesty. He's talking about the transfiguration. For he received honor and glory from God the Father when the voice came to him from majestic glory saying, This is my son whom I love, with whom I am well pleased. But now we have the word of the prophets made more certain. I ask you this. If you and I had the choice, wouldn't you want it to be up on the Mount of Transfiguration? That whiteness, that brilliant transformation of our Lord, so that the human eye could not contain it. Moses and Elijah descending from the heavens, and our Lord himself so glorified, so radiant, so that the Peter falls on his face and says, why don't we stay here? There was possibly no more ecstatic moment in sacred writ outside of the resurrection itself. But listen to what Peter says. We have the more sure word of prophecy. He goes to the word as something stronger and more certain. Here's my question to you, and this may hurt. My wife and I for years have had a habit of just going out every Saturday morning and enjoying a breakfast together. And I said to her today, a lot has happened in my own life in the last few months that I am so grateful to God for. It has been the recovery of the early morning hours with God. I know not everybody likes the early morning hours and I don't like them either. But let me tell you something. The surge of emotion is going to storm you every day. Some disappointment, some hurt, some heartbreak, some conflict, some argument probably, some struggle. The only way I know of to face it is to prepare this heart first thing in the morning before you face the day and let his language come to your heart before you do anything else. When I get into that study in the morning about 6.30, downstairs in my study, I say this with God as my witness. That next one and a half to two hours are the hours I enjoy the most every day. I have paced the floor. I have heard from my Lord. I have read his word. And I've come to the conclusion with all of the years I have been a believer, the days that have gone best for me are the days where I've heard from him first. Early will I seek thee, says the psalmist. My dear friend, if you ever want to know the victory over feelings, try this. Go early and seek him so that he prepares that conditioning, that heart of yours and conditions. You don't do that and the emotions will knock you over by the middle of the day. You'll be operating impulsively rather than from the sanctity of a heart seasoned 
by the sound of his reason. History is replete with examples of what happens when you hear from him. John Wesley, May 24, 1738, a man whose life had become barren even though he was a preacher, and he walked into this Moravian meeting in Aldersgate in London, and a preacher was reading the preface to the commentary on the book of Romans by Martin Luther, and he walked out of there saying, my heart was strangely warmed. May I remind you, I don't believe England would have survived had it not been for the preaching of Wesley and Whitfield. Many historians grant it. Even the secular historian Lecky, talking about the French Revolution, said that same revolution would have destroyed England too possibly. But there were two preachers by the name of Wesley and Whitfield. One simple verse that emerged from the preacher's mouth on the book of Romans transformed a man who was going to shape history. Think of Luther himself as he was on his knees walking up the Lateran staircase in Rome seeking absolution when one verse struck him. One verse, the just shall live by faith. Why am I doing this? The just shall live by faith. Comes to us in the book of Habakkuk, repeated to us in the book of Romans, the greatest of the European churches, repeated for us in the book of Galatians, the greatest of the Asian churches, repeated for us in the book of Hebrews, the greatest of the Hebrew churches, as it were. The 613 precepts of Moses reduced to one verse, the just shall live by faith. And on October 31, he go in 1517, Luther walks up to the Wittenberg door and nails those 95 theses out of zeal and love for the elucidation of the truth. The following thesis will be debated. In February of 1881, there was a funeral in Russia. Russia had never seen a funeral like that before. It was the funeral of a man who had died fairly young in his life, and his name was Fyodor Dostoevsky. Dostoevsky, when his casket was carried through St. Petersburg streets, 40,000 men followed his casket. When Tolstoy was told that Dostoevsky had died, he said one of the most luminous intelligences, one of the greatest spirits, he said, saints, has passed away from the scene. Do you know what happened in Dostoevsky's life? When he was in Siberia in a concentration camp, two women handed him a New Testament. And in that Siberian prison, he read the story of the prodigal son that changed him. Read all of his novels, Crime and Punishment, Brothers Karamazov, and you will see somewhere the conversion of some vile individual. It is Dostoevsky reliving what happened to him in prison through the simple reading of the prodigal son. If one verse, one chapter, one parable can change a life and transform, Dostoevsky was a passionate man. He was a Christian existentialist in the sense where feelings were so important to him. When he lay dying, he heard his daughter calling him saying, calling her saying, bring me the Bible and read to me that story of the prodigal son one more time. When Raskolnikov, the murderer in crime and punishment, asks Sonia, the prostitute, what to do with his life, he says, take out the Bible and read it to me. Dostoyevsky's life was changed by the word. Seek him early because feelings will betray you. It is information that will carry you. It is the language of God to your heart and to mine. Some years ago, I was in Damascus, Syria. I love the Middle East part of this world. I miss it so much when I'm not there, as turbulent as it is sometimes. One day, I'd finished speaking at a church in Damascus, and a man came to me and whispered to me, will you drive in the car with me, please? I'll take you to where you're going next. He said, I want to tell you the story of my life. And I sat there and listened. He said, Mr. Zacharias, during the war with Israel, I was a Syrian soldier on the Golan Heights. I knew it was over that night. I knew we were going to be finished. As the Israeli troops were closing in, I knew we'd be whipped, he said said, I didn't know what to do. But I dipped into my bag, and this big man says, my mother had given me a Bible. And he said, there on the Golan Heights, late at night, I took out a flashlight and I read the Bible. It brought me to Christ. He said, I wept on the mountain, knowing I had no, on the hill, knowing I had no strength left to fight. I'd been battle-weary. 
And his commanding officer came and said, because the battle was going to be so heavy that night they needed fresh troops, we were going to be replaced. He said, I walked away and went back home. He said, today I am at this church to listen to you, and I want you to know what you're preaching is the truth. I found that Christ on the Golan Heights the night before we were vanquished. The word, God's language to our hearts. Secondly, as you look in that upward, I challenge you to for the language that you speak to yourself. Let me just quickly read this to you. Oswald Chambers says there are things we must not pray about. Moods, for instance. Moods never go by praying. Moods go away by kicking. A mood nearly always has its seed in the physical condition, not in the moral condition. It is a continual effort to listen to moods which arise from a physical condition, never to submit to them for a second. We have to take ourselves by the scruff of the neck and shake ourselves, and we will find that we can do what we said we could not. The curse with most of us is that we won't. The Christian life is one of incarnate spiritual pluck. He says, unless we train our emotions, they will lead us around by the nose and we will be captives to every passing impulse or reaction. But once faith, has, once faith is trained to control the emotions and know how to lean resolutely against weakness of character, another entryway of doubt is sealed shut forever. Much of our distress as Christians comes not because of sin, but because we are ignorant of the law of our own nature. I don't know how you feel, I can speak for myself. From the moment I awaken, myself is speaking to me. I hear all kinds of thoughts coming into my mind. And what Oswald Chambers and my utmost for his highest says, reverse that, speak to yourself. Do you think that sort of suggestion? Absolutely not. The Apostle Paul says it to the Corinthians. For my part, I run with a clear goal before me. I'm like a boxer who does not beat the air. I bruise my own body and make it know its master. David says, be at rest once more, O my soul, for the Lord has been good to you. The language of God to you. The language of you to yourself. Thirdly, the language of obedience. For the Greeks, it was truth by reason. For the Hebrews, it was truth by obedience. If you're living a disobedient life, nothing is going to help the feelings until you start living that obedient life. Fourthly, the language of friends. The language of friends. Read the book of Job, and you will find out why God was angry with the friends who failed to support Job. After being on the road for 25 years, I have come to value so much friendships. Sometimes it'll be a phone call, sometimes it'll be a little note. And all over this globe today, when you land and you're embraced by somebody, I treasure those friendships now. I treasure them very, very dearly. And the greatest friend, of course, God has given is in the immediate family where your partner or your children, and if you're not blessed with that and have learned to bore a life alone so graciously, friends have carried you, you will testify to it. It is the language of God. It is the language of us to ourselves. It is the language of obedience that doesn't just go with emotions. Could I illustrate that briefly because I ran past that so quickly? I think I've learned more from observing Margie in this than from anything I could have ever learned from myself. And you'll have to pardon me for saying this, but I have learned what her great strength is in these, and I don't want to embarrass her in this. But any time there has been a disagreement, or any time there's been a point of tension of some sort, and the feelings want you to proudly turn away and not make it right because somehow you want to appear strong, you know what that's like. I have watched her reach out every time, just grab that hand and put it all back in perspective that it is the love that is going to carry us through understanding this, however minor or however moderate the issue may be. Obedience precedes the emotion. The language of obedience, the language of friends, and lastly, the language of the church. I love the church. Our ministry stands alongside the church. Long after these parachurch ministries have come and gone, it is the church of Christ that is going to stand. I believe the church is one of God's greatest gifts 
to our lands, where there is a community of believers, where they take you in, where they love you, where they accept you. And the church makes a dangerous mistake when it becomes a condemning community rather than a receiving and a healing community. The church flirts with danger when it can judicially deal with people and forget the grace that must accompany everything. We long to be part of that body and God has given to us his bride. It is a community that helps us in the feelings. But I want to underscore one other thing the church does. It gives us the gift of music, which is one of the greatest gifts I think humanity has ever enjoyed. The gift that we have witnessed tonight and received tonight. And so hear me carefully so you don't misread me. We live dangerously with music that moves so quickly that caters to the ecstasy of the moment, but does not give time for reflection. I am mystified by a generation that can sing the same chorus 20 times, but cannot sing four verses of a hymn. I don't understand it. Is it because we take leave of thought where we can repeat and repeat and repeat and not think of the wealth of thought that is unfolding? I say to you that music comes into your life and builds a reservoir so that in the moments where you're down and in the moments where you're dark inside, the song or a hymn or a chorus or whatever it was will come back to lighten your path and lessen your load. There's a Reader's Digest article that says when we're alone, we dance. I don't know if that's true, but I do know when we're alone, we sing. And that's about all I'm ever going to do, not cursing anybody with my voice of music. But I'll tell you what, the great hymns, the great songs that you can sing in a car or sing alone at home or listen to by way of a record or a tape. Ladies and gentlemen, when the church gives us that gift, it gives us the sentiments that can lift us in darker moments. I saw this demonstrated and I'll close with a couple of applications and I'll be through. Last year my father-in-law suffered a heart attack very surprisingly. He was with us in Atlanta here at that time and had to go back to Toronto. But because of a medical plan there where it is a socialized medicine, even though he was in a very serious condition, he was going to have to wait seven or eight months before he could have his open heart bypass surgery. He was not sure he was going to make it. He was living with a lot of fear. And so we were in church this Sunday morning while he was at home, resting, battling this through, really emotionally struggling. And doctors will tell you when a person feels that he is that critical and that serious, chances are he may not make it the length of time that he's been asked to wait. And I was sitting in the balcony with Margie and our children, and downstairs was my mother-in-law sitting next to her friends. I watched her through the whole service. She had a very sad countenance the whole time. The preacher was done, the testimonies were done, everything was done. And then the closing hymn began, and then the tears could no longer be repressed. This was the hymn that was being sung, and the tears just flowed. It put it all together for her. Be still, my soul. The Lord is on thy side. Bear patiently the cross of grief or pain. Leave to thy God to order or provide. In every change he faithful will remain. Be still, my soul, thy best, thy heavenly friend, through thorny ways leads to a joyful end. Be still, my soul, the hour is hastening on, when we shall be forever with the Lord, when disappointments, grief, and fear are gone, sorrow forgot, love's purest joys restored. Be still, my soul, when change and tears are past, all safe and blessed we shall meet at last. I watched her cry and I thought that was good. It was therapeutic. Everything had come together. The word of God to her, the language, the language of her to herself as she had been in church there reminding herself of the truths, the language of friends seated around her, the language of obedience, a life that has served him over all these years, and now the language of the church 
as the song was ministering to her heart and lifted above the dark night of loneliness and possible heartache around the corner. All that is said now with the outward look, the inward look, and the upward look of language. Where and how do we solve it? Please give me five minutes and I'll be through. It is this. I believe with all my heart there is no other way that I know of. I don't know of any religious system. I do not know of any philosophy. I do not know of any other answer other than this. When Jesus Christ himself walked this earth, what was the most dreaded moment for him? That moment was the cross. At one point with anguish he says, is there any other way? Nevertheless, not my will but thine be done. I don't think it was the physical pain. I think it was that terrible prospect of his father himself turning his face away from him. And that's why he cried and said, my God, my God, why have you forsaken me? I've pondered long and hard, and it may be obvious to you, but I come with this conclusion now. It is not that you come to Christ and say, I believe that is sufficient then it's a kind of, I'm still not found what I'm looking for attitude. Please listen to me, every man and woman here tonight, every young person. There is only one way. That way of the cross that took our Lord and brought him to the point of crucifying his own desires. Something tells me, and I want you to watch this now because this will anchor it. Something tells me the world knows the answer in the cross because it emerges every now and then in some form. But we do not know what its cost will be for us and so we turn away. I think the world understands what the cross is about because there's a cosmic sense to it and there's a personal sense to it, but they back away. Can I tell you why I believe that? For two reasons. Number one, when you look at the cross, you see the concrete expression of pain. That sin is not just an idea. It's an actuality. Something physical, concrete is happening. Elie Wiesel, the Nobel Prize winner, when he was in the concentration camp under the Nazis, had this experience. He said, I saw three men, two men and a boy, brought up to the scaffold. They were about to be executed. The two men died instantly. The young boy struggling in the throes of death, struggling, 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 not quite giving up, knowing he was going to die, but battling away. And these other Jewish prisoners were brought out to watch this terrible spectacle. And Wiesel said as he ground his hands one into the other, unable to see this, watching this boy struggle, he heard a man behind him saying, where is God? Where is he? Where is God? Where is he? And he said, in my own heart, there leaped up the question, where are you, God, in all of this? He said, and a voice emerged from within me saying, right in the gallows. That's where I am. I'm right there. I'm in that noose. Where did he get this idea from? May I suggest to you, it is the cross with Christ himself who bears the cosmic pain. Ah, but let's bring it down to where you and I sit. This has anchored it for me. With all of the darkness morally that we see, Ladies Home Journal in its latest issue picked out a beautiful little two-liner. It said this, morality is going, it's dying. But let's not forget there's a man, it said, like David Kaczynski, who found out that the Unabomber may well be his brother and dared to phone the police and tell him, I think it's my brother who's doing it. We're thinking of Ted Kaczynski going through this, possibly if he turns out to be the guilty one, possible execution. What do you think David's going to go through? Something confronted him. He was going to have to, David, either kill his conscience or kill his desires for self-centeredness. And he gets on the phone and calls the police and says, I think I may have a clue for you on who the Unabomber is. That was in one instance. You look at the cross where the pure suffered for the impure, the just for the unjust. And ladies and gentlemen, may I say to you, 
one way or the other, the world is going to break us, either with a lie, when it cannot put us back together again so we feel illegitimately, or with the truth, where we are crucified with Christ and reign with him, knowing that the day comes when he will wipe away all tears. My answer to feeling is, unless you go to Calvary with him, the lie will kill and feelings will mislead. You hear his voice and see him going to the cross and the answer is there. C.S. Lewis grappled with this very well in his book Narnia Chronicles where Edmund has betrayed them and Aslan the lion is going to have to pay with his life. Listen to how Aslan says it when he's broken the ropes of death and the stone table is broken and Aslan the figure of Christ comes alive again. And listen to what the children say to him. How did this happen? How did this happen? Here's Aslan's answer. It means, said Aslan, that though the witch knew the deep magic of the law, there is a magic deeper still which she did not know. Her knowledge only goes back to the dawn of time. But if she could have looked a little further back into the stillness and the darkness before time dawned, she would have read there a different incantation. She would have known that when a willing victim who had committed no treachery, was killed in a traitor's stead, the table would crack and death itself would start working backwards. You can either define life by feeling and life itself, or you can start defining life by first facing up to death. Not the death physically, but the death of your own self-centeredness. So you see, when Gary and Mary Jean Chauncey gave little 11-year-old Audrey her life. It was the willingness for them to lay down their own that gave her her physical life. That's the principle in spirituality too. Unless you're willing to be crucified with him, you will never understand what it is to live above emotions, however legitimate they may be. But the day will come where it's joy forevermore and the tear is wiped away. Till then, feelings must conform to reality, always seen through the eyes of our Lord, as he was on the cross, who for the joy set before him, endured the cross, despised the shame, and is now seated at the right hand of God the Father. Why don't you feel your faith? Ask yourself if you have been to Calvary and crucified yourself. And that life then lives within you, as God himself reigns within your heart. May God bless you. It's been a winding path, but I hope there's some light at the end of it all. Thank you for giving me a hearing.